I want you to turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 through 10, and we're also going to take a look at 1 Kings 19 in a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 through 10, and then 1 Kings 19. Last week I, I, I shared my heart with you um, about what it means to be a biblical church. Not the church that we typically dialogue about in the way that we dialogue about it, in a common way. Yes, maybe some of that, but wherever the scripture says a church should be, that's where we want to be. Now we can easily uh, accentuate our differences, our different traditions, styles, denominations. Uh, you know, pretty much it's pretty easy to do. Anybody can do that. And frankly, it's kind of trite and, you know, kind of boring. I'm kind of tired of it. I've been there and I've done that and I don't really see it going anywhere, but I do see something in the scripture that I do feel as a leader, if you will allow me to lead, I can lead this church. It's a place of depth, it's a place of impact, it's a place of joy, it's a place of inspiration, it's a place of transformation. Um, it's a place where God is calling this church and uh, frankly, I'm gonna be very candid about it because I'm very sure about it. Uh, what I'm about to share with you, I'm very confident of. Not because I was confident of it last week or the week before, but because for two and a half years, God has been dealing with me on this issue. And it's now time, I think, to allow that to come to the surface. The passage we're going to look at, one particular verse, was downloaded into my heart about 20 years ago when I first started in ministry. I didn't know what it meant. I wasn't all that bright back then. Not that I am now, but I am as it applies to this verse. It has to do with being a farmer for God. So let's take a quick look at it, then we'll get to 1 Kings, and I'll hopefully make a point under the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 9. Brothers and sisters, I, did not, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. You're infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. Corinth was a church that had difficulty, as many of you know. The context of which he's writing is such that they had all kind of problems. And uh, we don't need to go into all of that because we don't have those problems. But there is something here we do need to understand. In the 21st century church in the United States of America, as mega churches flourish and grow and grow and congregations become bigger and bigger and bigger, many of which you spend half your life in, the need for milk becomes higher and higher. The larger the congregation, the less meat can be served because the more people are excluded from that meat. We happen to be a congregation that has been around the block a few times. For most of you, this isn't your first rodeo. And as a matter of fact, you've done the tour of the churches and you're in this season of your life where if you listen to me long enough, I'm gonna challenge you to get up and do something. This is no exception. This is not a congregation that will tolerate milk for very long. Now, also in our church culture, the discipleship process is becoming more and more difficult because most believers are only allocating their Sunday morning experience to the discipleship process, and this becomes difficult. If you give too much milk too often, you'll never make disciples. If we don't step beyond the Sunday morning experience into relationship with other people that will help us grow in depth, it probably won't happen. But Suffice to say, no milk Sunday morning. No skim milk, no whole milk. It's time for some meat, and it's time for a challenge, and it's time for some action. That's why I'm here to talk about this today. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? What kind of statement is that? Are you not acting like mere humans? Gee, I thought I was a human. Are you, is anyone here not a human? That'd be something to take note of. For when one, one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? All right, well, we don't need to accentuate it too much. Sometimes we follow certain people, certain preachers, certain denominations. I guess that's good. They have their good things to them. There's advantages to infrastructure and organization, accountability, training, and resourcing. That's all good stuff. But... You and I are not called, apparently, according to this passage, just to act like mere humans. You and I are called to live a transcendent life. What is that? It is a life that rises above circumstances, sees things in different ways, communicates in different ways about what you see going on in your life and in the world, and lives in the power of Christ in a way that is revelatory, interesting, insightful, and wise. 
It's uncommon. It's extraordinary. We don't gravitate to the party line, to the talking points of everyone else. We're thinkers who believe and believers who think. We are people who are seeking to live in Christ above and beyond mere humanity. I don't want to live like a mere human being because I want the divinity of Christ and the power of the Spirit at work in my life, as do you. Our life shouldn't look like mere human beings. Though we're broken vessels and sinners, I get that, but in partnership with God, the individual, you, your marriage, together, your family, collectively, and this collective family ought to have something going on in and among us that is not mere human. If so, why go to church? What's the point? I want to see the Spirit of God working in a group of people, don't you? I think that's what Paul was talking about. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. Okay, here's the verse. We are God's, this is a biblical church now, we are God's co-workers. In God's service, you are God's field. God's building. Let me elaborate. Another, another translation. We are God's workers. Working together. You are like God's farm. God's house. If you want to understand the 21st century church who's moving in the power of the Spirit biblically, you cannot divorce yourself from the concept of a farm. A husbandry. Not an organization, but an organism. An organism where living things are resourced and stewarded. Opportunities, resources, tilling the ground, planting the gospel, watering the gospel. All of these things have to happen in a vibrant, healthy, functioning church that you don't see in an inactive, dysfunctional, non-living body of believers. God has called us to be his farmers. And if there's ever a church where God has called us to be his farmers, it's this one. What do I mean by that? Where would we be without farmers? Each of us would weigh about 65 pounds. The breadbasket of the Midwest wouldn't feed the world, nor would it feed us. Apart from farmers, we're in trouble. If Jerusalem and Israel doesn't take the Jezreel Valley and the Plain of Sharon and turn it into the breadbasket for Europe, they have nothing to eat, nor does Europe. Farmers are important. Farmers are people who cultivate and share resources one with another. Malachi put it this way, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that what? There might be food in my house. We are people who resource others with food, spiritual food, practical food, encouragement, the gospel. We are feeders of people. We are particularly a group of people at 4,000 feet who have been fed mightily, who have been resourced mightily, who have been blessed mightily, and within us is silo after silo after silo of spiritual food, experience, and resources. And isn't it interesting, where the resources are the greatest, typically the need is the least. And where the need is the greatest, the resources are the least. So this brings me to my point. What if the church was one? What if we didn't follow certain people? What if this church actually entered into strategic partnerships with other ministries that had a lack of resources and a higher need than we have? What would happen if those ministries partnered together? I'm not talking about throwing someone a bone once a week, once a month, once a quarter. I'm not talking about a slide presentation once a year that lets you know what's going on in XYZ foreign land as we bless somebody with $3,600 for a year's worth of work. I'm not talking about a mentality of the Syrophoenician woman who would settle for crumbs at the table of Jesus. I'm not talking about the church that is constantly thinking and taught to think and conditioned to think like we are nonprofit and we're not going to have enough and the ministries around the world are going to have to eke by as we just lavish ourselves in plenty. And they have needs. They have unreached people. They have people going to hell. They have depression, mental health issues. They have addiction. And here we sit. What does that partnership look like? 
in a farm cultivated church who understands the calling that God has placed upon them. This is where the fun begins. This is where it gets interesting. This is where it gets challenging. This is where the paradigm shifts from the common description of the church and who was, who was uh, came up in this church and came up in that church and we sit and compare notes and nothing really gets done. What does that look like? What does it look like if everyone in the room, spiritually speaking, was in overalls and came here in a tractor and understood that we're the farm of God. What does that look like? First Kings chapter 19. Verse 19 through 21. Elijah is a prophet of God, a man of God. He travels about proclaiming the word of God as a prophet does. And he realizes it's time for that mantle to pass from him, Elijah, to Elisha. Elijah is, guess what, a farmer. He's in the field. He's got a plow. He's got oxen. Two of the best of 12, actually. And they're yoked together. And he's plowing the field like a farmer does. Plowing the field in the noon, in the noon sun. And Elijah the prophet comes upon him and places his cloak over his shoulders. This is a game changer. He went from plowing the field one moment, maybe understanding his divine calling in life, maybe, maybe not, to looking now over at his shoulders and seeing a cloak, a mantle, representation of spiritual authority and calling and mission. And he's got to wrestle with the fact that I, do I answer that call? Do I accept that mantle of responsibility? Do I go with the authority that God has for me? Do I follow the footsteps of the man of God? Do I totally take myself out of a secular arena and put myself in a spiritual arena? What do I do? Do I continue to plow the field or do I turn and do I walk towards the prophet? What do I do in my life? And it's the same decision we make on a daily basis and it's the same decision we make in life. Was your job and career simply a job and a career, or was it a calling that had a spiritual purpose to it? See what happens. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? Giving him the time to go back, giving him the time to reflect, giving him a time to appropriately bring closure to this and, and to begin this transition, he goes back to his family to say goodbye. <laughs> what the thoughts must have been going through his mind? I'm not a farmer anymore. Do I have what it takes to be this prophet? My life's changing, I didn't expect this. This is a whole new season for me. This is a whole new way of looking at life. This is a whole new perspective. This is different. He didn't even, he probably couldn't even contemplate all at one time the changes and the decisions and the, the fear, the trepidation, the uneasiness, the worthiness. Am I qualified? Can I do this? Does it matter? Do I really matter? Am I really called to follow him? So Elijah left him and went back. Listen to what he did. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat, gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Man. This guy's definitive. Mom and dad um, was plowing, and you know Elijah, you've heard of him. He put his cloak on me a while back in the field, and I'm leaving with him. I'm called to this. This is what I'm going to do. I'm take that yoke, I'm gonna take that plow, I'm gonna chop it up, I'm gonna start a fire. 
I'm going to slaughter those oxen. I'm going to put it on that fire. It's going to be a sacrifice, and I'm going to give the food to my family, and we're going to celebrate God's calling on my life. Wow, that's tremendous. What am I suggesting? Did we all do the same? Yes, in a way, I am. I'm suggesting that now is the time in the history of this church, and we are where we are because of our founding members of this church, and we've progressed and we've moved and we've transitioned and we've changed and we morphed because we're an organism and things are different now than they ever have been. But this is the season, this is the point where there's a point of reflection and we have to make a decision. Do we keep plowing the field the way we've always plowed it? Do we keep meeting our own needs? Or do we realize that we don't have a yoke upon us, that there's no, nothing impossible with us? We have no debt, we have no, the only indebtedness this church has is to Jesus Christ. We're a fluid church, a mobile church, a research, a resource church, and a research church. We are a church with seasoned leadership, quality leadership and elders, wise counsel, opportunities that abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Do we keep plowing the field the way every other church plows the field, or do we take a peek inside some of the New Testament there and say, you know what, I have a feeling, I just have a feeling, there's something about what's written in there we need to pay attention to. Could it be that we're called to be co-laborers with other ministries, co-partners with the koinonia of the Spirit, with the resources, with the prayer? What would happen if we decided, as it says in Philippians, to not only look out for our own interest, but also to the interest of others? What would happen if that church, of which I speak in Dundee, Scotland, became our partner. And when we read the scripture 24 hours a day for 77 straight hours, they did it at the same time. And when we fasted, they fasted. When we prayed, they prayed. And when we celebrated, they celebrated. And we communicate and we cooperate. What would happen if we traveled back and forth between churches and sent teams and built relationships? And what would happen if they sent us interns for three or four months at a time and we trained them in our ministry and they work here at the church? What would happen if we housed some people from Scotland three or four months at a time and we didn't hire somebody every time we needed somebody, that God provided fellowship and partnership from people around the world? What would happen if our children built relationships? with global ministries and came up in a world that is so racially divided and culturally and generationally divided that at the church they learned how to be one and walk in unity. What would happen if the partnerships that actually took place more than writing a check? What would happen if the businessmen and women of this church who loved to golf went to Dundee, Scotland and held workshops and seminars to those people over there and to guess what guys, ladies? 15 minutes away is St. Andrews. You know God's in that. What would happen if the number one Christian band in Nepal, if not the number one band in Nepal, with a network of hundreds and hundreds of churches, discipling 25,000 children a week, were blessed with a music center, where they could train worship leaders throughout the nation, and all 500 of those churches read the scripture at the very same time we are, and were linked with us, one Lord, one baptism, one spirit. What would happen? What would happen if we took global missions and made it not something we talked about, but actually lived for? What would that look like? Maybe it's time to look back at our plow and reevaluate the way we do church. Is it simply time to keep doing what we're doing? Or is it our time for our children to come up in a church in a relationship with a foreign land and foreign cultures? Is it time for 600 college students down there to see what a bunch of people like us can do in partnership with them? Is it a time to redefine what the church is 
in a way that no longer talks about old people with gray hair or no hair, where there's a bunch of brothers and sisters linking arms together to reach the loss because that's what we do, because we're farmers, because we till the soil. Last week, we lit a match. We lit a match under that church down there. For the second year in the row, they saw it, and they're beginning to see it, and the pastor's beginning to see it. Oh my gosh, they're just now starting to see what would happen. What would happen if we actually followed through the two congregations helping one another, scratching each other's back? What would happen if this congregation helped a pregnancy center secure a permanent location? What would happen? What, what would happen is, is that we would come to this place not knowing what's next. We would be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We would be, have so much resources we wouldn't know what to do with them. Our biggest problem would be how, who to allocate to, to use discernment on what to do. God would be blessing this church in so many ways it's not funny. And what would we do, sitting around going, another testimony? We're gonna hear another testimony. We have influence in the fastest growing college in the state of North Carolina. A whole network and infrastructure of the entire church in Nepal. And we have relationship with one of the coldest spiritual climates in Great Britain. And it's all just sitting there waiting for us to reevaluate and burn that yoke. Whatever yoke that restricts us from doing what God's calling us to do, burn it. And whatever beast we've created that's carrying the burden of ministry, slaughter it. Let's walk forward together as a church in a way that no one seems to want to actually consider. That's not territorial, that doesn't hoard wealth, that doesn't sit on provision, that freely, freely discerns prayerfully how we can actually help mobilize an army across denominations for the glory of God. We're God's farm. In many respects, we're God's breadbasket. What kind of church are we? Uncommon, unusual, unfettered, desirous of more than milk, and looking for a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Talk is cheap. I'm just now beginning to see it as the pastor. When I sat there and I thought about the babies that were born in our area because of our involvement, not because of anything we did, we just were willing. I, that clicked with me. Something clicked with me there. When I came back from Nepal in February and I saw those kids and I saw those, those teenagers and, and those Nepalese kids dancing joyfully, exuberantly, laughing, hugging each other, worshiping Jesus, and then I went outside and I saw downcast after downcast oppressed teenagers on motorcycles with masks on because of the pollution, looking for some sort of hope as to why they actually exist. I got it. When I listened uh, to Nathan McConnell talk about that Mainsdown church in, in, in Scotland, and I, and I heard about the depression and the addiction and the, and the, and the futility that exists in that community, I, I got it. So I began to think, what would happen in this 10-foot circle up here that would, would help you and your 50-foot circle over here figure out how what we do here is an epicenter of impacting people around the world? So I looked for an answer, and I found it in the New Testament. Be a farm. Be one who feeds. Be one who plants. Be one who waters. Be one who prays. This is an interesting passage we've seen it a million times, but have we seen it? Mark 11, 1 through 3, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at Bethany, the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? This is Jesus speaking. Say this, he says, the Lord needs it. <laughs> the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. 
The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. What does the Lord need from this congregation? A couple things. Realize that there has been a cloak placed on this ministry, and it's one of authority and influence. And to whom much has been given, much is required. Number one, realize the calling that God has placed upon us as a church. Two, realize, do you really want, do you really want to be the church? Because once you say yes, do I really want to be the church, you say yes to really what it takes to be the church. And number three, that the Lord has need of us. I know we say it all the time, the Lord doesn't need us. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. I know he has everything, but he needs us. He needs a donkey, he needs us. He needs us to do what? To be willing to evaluate the very things that we use to plow our own field for our own pleasure, for our own consumption. And to evaluate what it is we have been given, what we have earned, what we have been blessed with, and what mentality needs to be burned, and what mentality needs to be slaughtered so that in this chapter of our life we can do something so far beyond that which we could ask or even imagine. Began working with the staff two years ago with this statement. We are seeking to intensify the practical and spiritual impact of believers through strategic partnerships. Strategic partnerships and strategic relationships happen on a one-on-one -on -one basis. They happen between our teenagers and a mentor, between our student pastor, our children's workers. They happen all the time in the church. Mentor relationships, prayer partners, they're, they're all a small group ministry. They're all over the place, but they're also on a church-wide level. If you've been longing to see what the functional, vibrant, healthy church looks like, stick around because we're fixing to go into relationships with people on a global level. Timely, wise, incremental, deserving relationships that are prudent, well thought out, written down on paper with a vision cast that comes from the heart of God. And it's gonna be more than writing a check. Some of you will leave the country. Some of you may never come back. Some of you will leave and come back with good report. The Hispanic community in this area of the mountains is gonna find out what it's like to have personal friendships filled with laughter and breaking bread together with people that they work for. And we're gonna become cross-generational, cross-cultural, and we're gonna do what we want Congress to do, reach across the aisle and embrace one another for the glory of God and sharing our resources to do things that we only dream about. Or, We've gone so long not dreaming about them, we no longer even think about them. And we're gonna set an example. So next week, we're gonna hit it again. I'm asking you to prayerfully consider your willingness to press in to a vision of partnerships with other ministries that is costly Emotionally, spiritually, and financially. And are you willing to see and try God at his word while we meet our own needs and while we care for our own children and our own students? The Lord needs it and we'll send back shortly. It's tough to outgive God, but if you never give, you never learn that principle. We are God's workers working together. You're like God's farm, God's house. As we join our hearts together in prayer over the next few weeks, I'm, also, I'm of the opinion, I'm of the opinion that we can commit over the next couple of years north of a million dollars, north of two million dollars. If we can spend that on our own building, we can spend it on someone else's. In fact, we can invest it in someone else's. God's gonna turn this church inside out. 
And he's going to use every single blessing he's ever given us and every lesson he's ever taught us for his glory and for his honor. And I strongly urge you to paste your ears back and get ready because we're fixing to be a very, very, very biblical church. And that I'm very excited about. Let's pray. Lord, if it's in your word, let us be open to it. Put that word in our heart, please. Out of the abundance of our heart, may we act and speak, behave. Let the word guide this church to be the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the priesthood of all believers, the priests and ministers of the Lord who have access to the Father on behalf of others. And ask you, Father, to reap a harvest internationally, here in Jerusalem, our own Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Help us to that end, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.